my god. Tell and so occasionally, a... it's just like it just makes a pre- makes an, it actually. <laughs> this is our new, our new, uh, yeah, our new intro to welcome our guests onto the show <laughs> <laughs> with the singing bowl. <laughs> Unbelievable! Oh my god! Unbelievable! Um, um okay. Mm. Okay, I'm great. eating a snack while we do this. Okay. We're all okay with that, right? Yeah. You, I, I mean, definitely. <clears throat> dietitian. <laughs> Hashtag dietitian. I just Coming in hot. Coming in hot. Um, yeah. Okay. We started the recording, Annie, so that it doesn't feel super weird and yeah awkward when we actually just kind of like start talking about the pieces that we want but okay. bef- when we all say goodbye at the end don't hang up we'll all wave bye i'll see you later and then just stay on because yeah. we have to upload it first and then you can jump off mm-hmm. okay it takes like 30 seconds to a minute or so yeah. it's not usually yeah not okay. usually a big old thing but perfect mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. <sighs> okay okay cool. you want to do it for my Actually, I was thinking that Annie could, I would love to hear Annie introduce herself and tell us about what she does and what lights her up and her work. And <laughs> that's so exciting. Annie, who are wait. you? Yeah, tell us. <laughs> um, so I'm Annie. Um, I'm a registered dietitian and uh, certified leap therapist. And um, I mainly focus on adults struggling with a host of kind of underlying issues from autoimmune disorders. Um, I really got into this field because I myself suffer from an autoimmune disease and I felt like there was a need for it in our community because it's not something that doctors typically address. Um, how do you, you know, manage your disease with diet? I mean, it's hardly ever, ever discussed. So, and I found just with my own disease and my own kind of diet, I've been able to really reduce my symptoms and and almost put my disease into remission. So it's, wow. you know, I just kind of felt Unreal. like I had to do something to serve my population just to educate them on the importance of food and lifestyle and how that can really affect your disease and really improve your life. Oh, I'm so okay. excited. I Wait, already have we, 17 questions. <laughs> before we dive into questions, we got it. We haven't asked this question in a while. That's Annie, true. I know where you're going. What are you drinking today? What are you drinking right now? I'm drinking water. Nice. Perfect. <laughs> so boring. Good. No, it's not boring. It's vital. We know this, right? So Annie's drinking water. Kylie, what are you drinking? What do you have going on over there? Water. You're, you're, wow. Good for you guys. Oh. It's the most boring. I don't have coffee. I, nothing. You know, I have I, got snacks today. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh-huh. So tell us what you're eating. What are you eating? What are you munching on? I'm eating pistachios <laughs> and... Nice. Oh, I love pistachios. This is raw, grass-fed cheddar cheese. Nice. All the things. It's mm. so good with pistachios. Mm. I'm trying not to eat the pistachios because it's crunching in your ear. But <laughs> We're a big pistachio family. We fucking love pistachios. My favorite nut of all the nuts. Oh, Me too. Pistachio. Yes. Macadamia mm. nuts. I love mm. a macadamia nut. Mm. Kylie, when you come visit me, we'll have to take you to the coffee shop that makes the macadamia nut milk lattes. Mm. Um, I appreciate the use of when I come, not <laughs> if I come. Thank you. Yeah, no, because it's it's a when. It's when. I mean, oh, it's, a when. It's, just it's a when. It's just a when at this point. Exactly. Thank you. What are you drinking, Meg? <laughs> I am actually also being kind of boring. My my usual, I got the Ovacetol slash Avacetol. We're not still not sure of the right pronunciation. Do you know how to say that, Annie? uh inositol yeah it's inositol right inositol is the the thing that's in the supplement but the actual supplement name i don't know if it's ovacetol or ovacetol i don't know i've heard it both ways (laughs) anyway i didn't even know what it was to be honest with you so (laughs) i just know meg drinks it in the morning and it's morning her time (laughs) yep every day morning and night too i put it in my water so we got that we got some ginseng tea. We got some green tea in here. All in, This is all in one thing. And then I'm experimenting with um, bromelain as a, oh, as an anti, not, not as a digestive, as an anti-inflammatory. I found like a few baby studies 
that show that bromelain might help with inflammation, specifically in the nasal passages, not taken as a digestive enzyme though. So I have to be oh, careful. Oh, wow. Not, yeah. I have to be careful to have it in between meals, not when I'm eating. Otherwise it'll do the digestive Digesting. Function. Oh, that's yeah. so fascinating. Yeah. So I have really bad sinus issues like constantly. And then when I got COVID, it just ugh, like mm. threw me totally upside down. So now I'm like, all right, we have to fix this. <laughs> so that's amazing. we're experimenting. I'll report that's back. Let's yeah. know how it goes. That's right. In six months, tell us how that yeah. goes feels. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> so anyway, that's what we're drinking over here today. So that's not boring. That sounds delicious. I I mean, it's boring for me because I have this literal drink every, every single day. Yeah. <laughs> every time we record this podcast, I'm like, I got my tea and my obviously dog. <laughs> so <laughs> it's new team player with bromelain today. <laughs> You're really killing it now, Meg. Really killing I am. it. I am. Yeah. Um, anyway, proceed with okay. the 17 questions. Let's start. <laughs> Annie. I can't wait. Let's start. Can you tell us what is an autoimmune disease? So what is it in your body? What is happening? And And maybe what are some names of common autoimmune diseases that people will recognize and maybe not know? Oh, I didn't know that was an autoimmune disease. Yeah. So there's over like a hundred autoimmune diseases, <sighs> which is crazy. Of and <laughs> more and more keep coming, you know, they, they're now associating all these like neurological, like Parkinson's mm -hmm. and Alzheimer's. They are starting to think that those even have an autoimmune component too. So mm. basically what it is, is your body decides to attack itself. So you have your immune system, which is, is really designed to kind of protect you from the outside world. So like mm -hmm. anything that you ingest or you breathe in, like viruses, bacteria, um, anything that your body deems as foreign, your immune cells will attack it and then create antibodies against those so you don't have the same reaction again. And so your body can con continually protect itself. What happens with autoimmune disease is that you're, you develop um, antibodies against your own tissues. And, you know, depending on the autoimmune disease, it can be, you know, it can be tissues of certain organs, it could be like more broad tissues like joints and, um, you know, muscles. So it kind of it depends on which, which disease you have, but essentially your body is recognizing your own cells as foreign and so they attack it. So most people are dealing with just like chronic underlying inflammation from mm. these autoimmune diseases. And that's what causes a lot of the kind of annoying symptoms that come with it, like fatigue and mm. um, joint pain and muscle aches and headaches, mm. things like that. And so why might someone's body start making auto, I mean, antibodies against itself? What are some reasons why that might happen? Because what, what was funny for me is I, I held in my laugh because when you said, when you said that piece, the first thing that came to my mind was, whoops, like, why, why would it do that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's yeah. some, you know, a lot of people had thought, believe that it was a genetic disposition. And for a lot of cases, it, there is some genetic component to it, but there's usually something that triggers it. So yeah. it could be um, the environment, like too many chemicals. Um, mm -hmm. too much just inflammation in general. Um, it could be the food that you eat that your body is like reacting to. So a lot of times it's um, something kind of puts your body over the edge mm -hmm. and it just starts. There's so much going on that your immune system almost gets overwhelmed and confused and then starts creating these antibodies against it. Now, it's really interesting in that there's a lot of like totally healthy people that also have antibody like auto antibodies um, mm -hmm. but they they just don't have the kind of disease symptoms or they don't have a disease because it's not active so interesting. Yeah. What, it's so interesting that you said that because what comes to mind for me too is is um there's some research lately suggesting that something like acne has an autoimmune pathology or partly really so yeah, because the immune receptors on your skin are overreacting to a mm -hmm. clogged pore. They're like mm -hmm. inappropriately responding with inflammation and sending the white blood cells, which is the pus that you see in a pimple. Oh, that's so, so 
it's so so that would to me that's the example that comes to mind about what you were saying Annie about somebody who's not necessarily struggling with like your typical autoimmune not you we don't think is of acne as like your body attacking itself but that's kind of an example that came up for me about autoimmune like sliding under the radar kind of I think is totally. what, I was, what you were saying yeah yeah I mean it takes a lot of time for autoimmune diseases to develop too like a lot of people it you may have like really kind of vague underlying symptoms for like seven to 12 years before yeah. it's like a full-blown clinical Ugh, um, disease. That, like, oh that sounds exhausting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Annie, what's your story? Can you tell us what, like, what, what is your autoimmune story? How did you end up deciding how to help yourself, what you were going to do? And thank God you had the tools to do mm. it. And mm-hmm. then kind of let that lead you into what you do and how you, how you help your people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was diagnosed with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, like mm-hmm. a long time in my twenties. I mean, it was a long time wow. ago. What? That's, yeah. That's early in my late twenties. Isn't there? Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it is. So can you, I mean, I used to be, well, I still am like very active, but I was, mm-hmm. I, I, I had a different career. I worked in banking. I lived in New York. I oh. was competing in Ironman's. Um, I was just very like super active and, you know, kind of looking back on it, it's a combination of all those things that really, I think, triggered my disease Mm. because I had so much just like stress and, Mm. um, inflammation just from all of the excess activity plus like gut issues and and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I didn't even know about diet when I was first diagnosed and even though diet, you know, nutrition was something I've always been interested in you know, and I asked my doctor, like, what can I do? And she's like, you know, nothing, like nothing will really help. So I started taking medication and, um, and I went into remission, like pretty quickly, I was very lucky. I was already mm-hmm. following like a gluten and dairy free diet, because I had like IBS, and I was kind of mm-hmm. always dealing ah. with, with that. So I think that actually really helped, like mm-hmm. me not knowing it, but it definitely helped kind of calm everything down. Um, mm-hmm. And then, like, fast forward to me having kids, my disease came back. So I totally flared after both of my kids were born, Um, which is common because, you know, with rheumatoid arthritis, especially there's a couple of diseases that are um, affected by estrogen levels. Ah. So with like things like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, I think type one, type two diabetes or type one diabetes. Also, when you have a drop in estrogen, um, you can, it's more like inflammatory for you. Wow. So, yeah. So a lot of women, I mean, 80% of autoimmune disease patients are women. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of it does have to do with like hormone regulation. And a lot of people, Mm -hmm. you know, are first diagnosed around the time of either like puberty or pregnancy or menopause because of the hormone fluctuations. Yeah. I'm just curious, do you know what, do you know why that is? Like, what is it about the estrogen that can trigger something like that? So it has to do with the, um, the balance of your helper T cells, mm-hmm. uh, your Which are t- immune cells for those of you who don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Immune cells. So some diseases are like more T1 or T2 dominant. Mm-hmm. And so the diseases that are, um, I can't remember which is which, but Whichever one is like more like T1 dominant, mm-hmm. I think estrogen is more protective. Or if it's like oh. T2 dominant, estrogen is 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 more har- like harmful. And so that explains why it's only some autoimmune issues that tend to be more triggered by estrogen because it depends on what like branch of your immune system is more involved in that disease, right? Is what you're saying? Yeah, like which okay. whichever one is more off balance. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah. So, okay. So rheumatoid arthritis, doctor says can't really do anything. You're already on gluten-free and dairy-free, which is that something that you find, just a quick question, is is helpful for most people getting started? Yeah. Yeah. I know. Don't you hate it? Don't you wish there was like <laughs> one person where you're like, you know what, kid? It's cool. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. I, I have a four, a 14 year old that I'm working with right now. And oh. she, I know uh, it's oh, heartbreaking. She so just, she wanted to be able to have dairy. It was very important to her. Mm. And I was like, you are 14. I want you to do this. Yes. 
and mm-hmm. she was so sick. She was <sighs> so sick. I know. It was awful. So, okay. So dairy-free and gluten-free, you were already doing this, started your medication. What else, how else did you utilize food, whether it was taking things out or I imagine for a lot of people, it's also about what they have to add in. Mm. So what did you do for yourself? What, what did you find was necessary? So, I mean, I've always been a generally healthy eater. Um, and so I kind of thought, you know, I'm like, well, I already have gluten and dairy out. Like what else can I take out? Um, I, so I did the, uh, food sensitivity testing on myself yeah, and that and played the MRT test, the right, MRT. Yeah. Okay. And that was before okay. I was certified. Cause I was like, I don't know if I believe this. Like, um, <laughs> so I went through like a, another dietitian to like do it and, um, mm-hmm. oh my God, it made such a difference. Yeah. Like, Annie, help me tell the people how not all food sensitivity tests are created equal. Yes. Mm-hmm. Tell them. Tell them not to mail order something to their home and send it in. <laughs> no. So the difference with MRT is that it captures like every kind of what we call chemical mediators. So every anything that's like released from your blood cells in response to a food, it captures. Whereas a lot of the at-home food sensitivity tests are only like a very small immune, immune component. Um, they're mm-hmm. typically IgG and IgM, but IgG specifically, that Which can actually, antibodies for yeah, those, again, who don't know, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> go on. no, no, it's okay. Go on. <laughs> yeah. So IgG antibodies can actually be elevated in foods that you commonly eat. So it's not right. a really good like mm-hmm. indicator of what you're sensitive to. Cause if, it's like, not. And then it's very confusing because you get these results and you don't know mm-hmm. what the hell they mean and you don't know what kind of action to take. And it ends up being more confusing. I have yes. people come in with those test results all the time, mm-hmm. which they're means just, they like, still need help. I'm like, it I can't even read this. <laughs> no. Yeah. It sucks because they're just so easy, easy. Like, I love how easily accessible they are. But the the term that I, the, the phrase that I use or I hear thrown around a lot is that it's more like a food diary versus mm. like actual I, that's not my phrase. I stole it, but I don't know who from, but I, <laughs> that's, a, and I feel like that's kind of the case with those mail order I think, tests. I think that's good. Yeah. I yeah. mean, mm-hmm. anyway. Okay. So you did MRT testing, which is a food sensitivity test that's extremely detailed and in-depth. And you figured out which foods were causing inflammation, which foods were not. You took out the foods that were causing inflammation and instead focused on the ones that were not. And I I got that right so far. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, I followed that diet for, I mean, I still avoid a bunch of foods that I'm reactive to, but it really just helped kind of pinpoint like what, what might be causing it. And it was random things for me, like maple syrup was like a Mm -hmm. a highly reactive one. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeast was one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can't remember what else. Cucumber peach, like some random foods, which I just want to, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Finish. No, no. I was, I mean, most, like most elimination diets include those foods. So even if you do like a standard elimination diet, like you still might not feel great because like maple Mm -hmm. syrup is in like, you know, everything. Yeah, Yeah. 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 So here's a little plug, you guys, if you are struggling, whether it's with an autoimmune disease, any sort of inflammatory disease, which there's basically the same or Mm -hmm. gut things, and you think that you've been on some sort of really great elimination diet, please know that it's not always dairy, soy, and gluten. It can be Mm -hmm. something as benign as cucumbers. And and, and it's not, and Annie, I think is going to get into this. It's not like you can't ever have these things again once you take them out. Mm -hmm. But I, I think what Annie is showing us is that in order to have an opportunity for your body to heal and the inflammation to come down, it needs the space to do it. Right. Yeah. Is this what you've found when you did this? Yeah. Cause I mean, I add back in things, you know, I have cucumber every once in a while, mm-hmm. tomatoes bother me, but you know, in small quantities I can eat them. I mean, mm-hmm. gluten and dairy, I don't ever eat cause those are just huge triggers mm-hmm. for me. Like I feel awful for like a week <laughs> if mm-hmm. I have them, but mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, people are always so afraid of like, Oh, I can't ever have like coffee again or, you know, chocolate. And I'm like, you can in small quantities once your mm-hmm. body like heals. You need to like give it space to heal, right? I think that's just such an important key. Cause I, are we all leap therapists or 
Kylie you are, right? Are you Meg? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I use it in, in uh, cases where I think it's helpful for my acne clients. So, I had no, I, this is, yeah. Me. Yeah. Okay. Leap so therapists that's, unite. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's uh, one thing to note to our audience. We are all leap therapists. So <laughs> might be our opinion of these tests might be a little biased, but the reason I think I can speak for all of us that we became leap therapists is because it is a really helpful tool. So not to make this episode entirely about leap or um, the MRT test, but I wanted to fo to mention that when I did my first MRT test, the food sensitivity test, I was very high red. So very, very highly reactive to things like turmeric and kale. Like these are things that are mm -hmm. supposed to be healthy. Like we hear they're so anti-inflammatory and all the things. So I wanted to point that out. And you, Annie, with cucumbers, to point that out so our listeners can understand that it's, it's not like it really truly is an, a case by case individualized basis. And also I think it's important to point out more to your point, what you were saying about you just need space from these foods and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's because it you're, there might be other things going on, making it, making your body more reactive to these foods. So it's, again, it's not the food itself all the time. It's no. just what else is going on in the body that makes it so that, my body doesn't like turmeric at that time or kale or whatever, you know, and now I eat those foods fine now. Um, again, as an example of your point that you don't have to avoid them forever. But um, I think people are always shocked when I, when I say that, and I'm sure they were shocked about your story about cucumbers. So I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, go ahead. I was just going to have you keep going here with the, with the process. So you mentioned that taking these foods out provides space and an opportunity for you to do the healing. What yep. does that side look up, look like? Because I know there's a gut component, right? There always is with autoimmunity, right? Right. Yeah. So, so for me, for me, I, um, once I kind of figured out the food stuff, I became a lot more curious and started digging more into, you know, what are root causes of autoimmune diseases? How are they, how do they, how are they triggered? Cause I knew it wasn't just, food. It had to have been something else. So I started um, working with a functional medicine practitioner to do a bunch of testing to find out that I have, you know, a parasite and mm -hmm. mold toxicity and heavy metal toxicity and dysbiosis and all wow. this other stuff mm -hmm. going on. Candida. I mean, I have like so much going on. So, you know, food definitely helped me for sure. I feel like a thousand times better, but now I'm like in the process of dealing with everything else to kind of, mm. again, heal it because, you know, there's always like multiple underlying things that could be causing it. So can you explain, just connect the dots a little bit between why it was so important to identify the candida and the parasites and the dysbiosis? Why do those things and identifying them and healing them even matter? Because this might seem like they're so disconnected, but when we're talking about autoimmunity, explain why that stuff is so important. Because all those things are just adding more burden to your to your body and your immune system. And so a lot of times what you find with people with autoimmune diseases is that they, they can't detoxify and they can't get rid of things as efficiently as kind of your average person. So because they have all these other compounding issues going on that your body is fighting. So, you know, anytime you have a parasite, your body is actively fighting that if, and anytime you have like a yeast overgrowth, like you're constantly kind of, you're just, your immune system is like on attack all the time. And so you're mm -hmm. never going to really be able to heal and calm down your immune system to the point where it's not attacking your body anymore until you get all of that stuff out mm -hmm. and like cleared out of your system. Okay. Okay. So in other words, there are a ton of different things, or I'll, we'll speak to your story. There were a lot of reasons why your immune system was in overdrive and mm -hmm. then almost accidentally kind of tagging your own body tissue as part of the problem, tagging these foods that you were eating while you were sick, really, as mm -hmm. part of the problem. So all this stuff gets wrapped up into these underlying issues that take, to your point, years to identify mm. yep. or even to be thought of, right? Yep. 
And so none of that stuff on the surface is actually part of the problem. It just has to be addressed for a short period of time so that there's an opening to get to the deeper stuff. Is that what we're understanding? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Annie, what other systems, so we mentioned how you, we had started talking about how important the gut is with autoimmune. What other bodily systems are also influential of autoimmune diseases are connected. Because as Kylie said, I think we tend to think, we're taught to think of all our body systems as like separate entities. But it's the, I know in the work that all of us do, we actually look at all of it together. So what other body systems are also uh, connected with autoimmune or might, if, if that system is dysregulated, it might end up resulting in an autoimmune issue? So, I mean, it can be any system in your body. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, um, you know, even like with skin, like a lot of there's safe. (laughs) Yeah. No system is safe. (laughs) But I would say, you know, it's it's interesting that you mentioned the acne because, you know, I've read some research on, you know, just kind of like the first signs of autoimmune diseases. It can come from just like simple skin rashes because your skin is like your largest organ. So Mm -hmm. any sort of like inflammatory issue that you have going on in your body, it's going to manifest on your skin. So that's like a huge one too. Um, You know, your liver with a whole detoxification process, if that isn't working efficiently, um, you know, and your liver manages like, it's like, the powerhouse organ of your body. So if you're like, you're not detoxifying and like, that's not functioning, right? Like it affects, it affects everything. Um, And I know a lot of my clients deal with the like mental health issues, like depression and anxiety. Um, Stress is a big one that I see people with, um, you know, hormonal dysfunction, you know, Mm. it's all kind of related. So really like any body Parts or system. organ can affect it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it, I'm hearing that autoimmunity, I think we think of it as like, or at least I talk in talking with clients and in conversation, it's, it sounds like it's used in a way of like, it's its own separate thing, but really it's an imbalance of any, as a result of any of the bodily systems is what I'm hearing. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And what's interesting too is that depending on like what how your disease manifests, you see a different doctor. So, right. which I mm-hmm. think is so. Um, it's a great point. Fragmented, you know. It's you have so like fragmented. You have like your GI, like Crohn's and colitis for like GI, and then you have like thyroid for endocrine and and mm-hmm. you know diabetes, and then you have like your rheumatologist, which deals with a whole umbrella of things. But mm. it's not like it's not connected well. Mm. Well said. It is not yeah. connected well. What you really need, ironically, is actually <laughs> somebody like you who takes a look at autoimmunity. All like the the actual name of the disease is less important. Not that it doesn't matter, but it's less important than the overall point, which is that your body is attacking itself, and that's not normal. Like, let me just make that a, a, a moment here, guys. If you have an autoimmune disease, <laughs> it's not normal. It's it's common, like it's very common. I also have I've got uh, Hashimoto's. It's not normal. Your body doesn't just start attacking itself. There's a reason. And if Mm -hmm. there is a reason, it means that there are things that you can identify and make changes to. Is there a genetic component to it? Yeah, of course there is. It's not the be all end all though. There is, and Annie, I think, tell us, does it matter which comes first? Does it even matter just if the autoimmune Great comes first? Great question. Right, or if the gut stuff, stuff comes first? I've never met anybody with an autoimmune disease that doesn't have gut stuff, oh whether God, they yeah. want to admit it or not. <laughs> Every single one of my clients, it's always Every like a gut. It, it's a, it is a gut issue. I mean, it's like the three it's things are issue. like genetics, which something has to like trigger it, right? It's leaky mm-hmm. gut. And then it's some, it could be like some environmental factor, Bingo. whether it's like stress or chemicals or something else, like those three mm-hmm. things. And then diet, obviously, because, you know, if you eat like a shitty diet, like yes. you're setting yourself up for more inflammation and yes. worse gut permeability and dysbiosis and all that stuff. And you started this by saying that your rheumatoid arthritis is pretty much in remission. 
Yeah. Did you hear part. that, guys? It's pretty much in remission because she <laughs> dealt with the underlying root causes. Now, I want to make a point here to say, and Annie, correct me if I'm wrong here. Not everybody who has food sensitivities automatically, therefore, has an autoimmune disease. But I mm. would probably wager a guess that everybody who's suffering with an autoimmune disease you would at least benefit from identifying which foods are causing inflammation and kind of adding to that bucket that's overflowing as your disease so that there's an opening, right? It's all about mm. giving your body that opportunity to even have a fighting chance of healing itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I would then say- you have to find somebody like Annie who's going to ask the right questions for you, right? That's the huge part of it. Who's yeah. asking the right questions? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's going back into a patient's history and, and, you know, asking them, it sounds weird, but like, what was your health like growing up? What were you exposed to? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you were just trying to find more information about, you know, what could possibly be causing it and triggering it. And, you know, a lot of times you'll find, I find that their disease is like comes about when it's like a really stressful situation Mm -hmm. or, you know, they weren't eating well, or, you know, there's always some sort of like immediate trigger there, but Mm. it's probably been, you know, manifesting for like a long time. A long time. And I'm going to add to what you just said there, because I'm just recently diving into some of this research. It's, it's weirdly fascinating. And this is not going to shock either of you, but (laughs) (laughs) people who have a history of abuse, or Mm. trauma, which Mm -hmm. could mean a million things, right? Mm -hmm. And those who have experienced more traumatic incidences in their life than others have a significantly higher chance of having gut issues. They're, you know, the research is calling it, quote, IBS, because it's kind of a Mm -hmm. catch-all. And so when, and we just said, when you have gut issues, it doesn't matter which came first, it immediately opens up a bigger window to the possibility of autoimmunity. So know that about yourselves too. If you are listening to this and you've been not feeling well and maybe getting the run around and maybe feeling like people aren't digging or not really asking the right questions and you are seeing yourself in this, in Annie's story, find somebody who you can ask these questions to. Reach out to Annie. She is going to tell us in a minute about an incredible opportunity actually that is coming out soon for you. I think tomorrow, right? Next week. Next yeah. Week. Next yeah. Right. yeah. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> by the time this episode, episode aired. plays. <laughs> when this episode aired, it'll be tomorrow. So. I like winked at her. It's like tomorrow, right? <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Huh?" laughs> so for the listeners, let's be clear. That's June 22nd, 21st, right? June 21st. June 21st. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Could we have made that slightly more confusing for people? <laughs> I was so I was trying to be so encouraging for people and I just messed up the date of your thing. That's funny. Yeah. No, it's super encouraging. <laughs> oh my god. And I'm gonna I wanna say this too. Okay, so so Annie, you mentioned that autoimmunity can take a really long time to get a, an official diagnosis. And you're also saying that the type of work that you're doing really doesn't, not that it doesn't require, but the diagnosis is just the extra stuff. So whether or not you have your diagnosis already, if you just kind of suspect or think or generally feel super inflamed, have gut issues, feel really tired, maybe you have joint pain, right? Am I, are, are these all the things, Annie? Yep. Yeah. It doesn't require, no diagnosis necessary, in other words. Yeah. You don't need a name to be given to the way that you feel to be able to dig into the same information because it's going to bring you the same type of relief. Yeah. It's and incredible. I've, and I've worked with like a number of different autoimmune diseases and, you know, not that I follow the same thing with everyone, but it's the same general advice and, you know, sure, a few diseases here and there has specific needs, but in general, like you can definitely fix a lot of things just by changing your diet and working on lifestyle factors like sleep and stress. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you have any underlying emotional issues, like those definitely need to be addressed. Yes, so. they do. 
Mm. Say that one again. Say that last one again. <laughs> Underly- underlying emotional issues or trauma. I mean, you cannot believe how much that can, can like connect and trigger an autoimmune disease. I mean, it's there's non-negotiable. There's books on it. Like, yeah. Yeah. And if anyone's wondering it. how to do that, check out, listen to last week's episode where we interviewed uh, an energy healer. <laughs> and mm. We talked a lot about that. But um, so any, yeah, can you, ex- can, is there any little nuggets, um, like, can you expand on that a little bit about if someone's listening to this and they're kind of feeling overwhelmed and are just kind of like, I don't know if I have an autoimmune or we, we, we noticed, or we talked about how you don't necessarily have to know, but like, what is the persona of the person who should be listening to this episode, who should be taking action? And then can you take us through what the first couple of steps of those actions should look like for that person? Is that a really yeah. tough question? Sorry. No, I mean, not at all. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to think back to when, like before I was, before I was diagnosed, I mean, I definitely had some you know, weird joint pain going on, but I kind of dismissed it as like sports related. Um, Mm. You know, fatigue was like through the roof. Like I could barely get out of bed. Um, You know, digestive issues Mm -hmm. up the wazoo. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, if you feel off and you feel like something is not quite right, Mm -hmm. you know, and your doctor and everything checks out as normal, then that's kind of when you should maybe consider Bingo. making some yeah. changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It because you can, wrong. yeah. I mean, you can, you can stop an autoimmune disease from actually like coming to fruition. Like wow. if you do enough, if you knew, do enough kind of before it's like a full blown autoimmune disease, you mm-hmm. can actually prevent it from really, you know, becoming one, which That's would save really a lot powerful. of time and effort. Yeah. It sounds like there's, it's like, if you're a person who's got a lot of symptoms going on that you can't really attribute to anything in particular, but it's a lot of them and they all don't seem related and you're having trouble putting it together. That that's what I'm hearing. Sounds like the person who should be listening to this episode is, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm going to say too, don't, don't forget about the neurological components. I know in the years leading up to finally getting some sort of diagnosis for me, there were these I, I, like seven or eight years of these weird episodes where mm. I would just start shaking and I couldn't speak and I couldn't talk properly. It was all, it, it, I cut out gluten and it all went away. All so, went so away. So wild. So That's wild. And that was and, an example for you of where you had these yes. things going on. Could it, nobody it, from your, from, I think from what I remember what you said, nobody could really put a name on it or identify why it was happening. Everything came back fine, but then you eliminated gluten and poof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and listen, are. like that's not going to be everybody's story, but right. the, the point here is that I know that you guys are seeing yourselves in these examples. I know mm-hmm. you are. We have all felt that like, wow, why do I feel insane? Why do I feel like a crazy person? And why can no one help me? What Mm. is the answer? And it just may be that you're in that weird in between place where the measurables aren't measurable yet, Mm. but it doesn't mean that you're not feeling like shit yet. I mean, I, and Mm. and you also just might not be getting the right labs. Annie, how often do people miss Hashimoto's because they don't get the right labs Mm. or all the time, Mm. all the time. Can can you tell us, are are there, and I mean, I know this is a hard question because there's a whole plethora of different diseases, but like, if you had to prioritize the most important set of labs to, for someone who might be struggling with a variety of issues, are there specific labs that come to mind that you are just kind of like, no, we must get these done. I will fight with your doctor. Like, That's a great question. Happen. That's a good question. <laughs> I think like just the general inflammatory markers are always really helpful. Like your sedimentation rate, your CRP, um, Mm -hmm. those can just point to, you know, underlying inflammation in general going on Mm -hmm. in your body. And that can be like an easy thing to address. And I mean, again, it also depends on your symptoms, but I, you know, I always say like get a Mm -hmm. full thyroid panel if you're feeling fatigued um, because that can be totally attributed to hypothyroidism. 
And can you um, tell uh, us, we went through, we had an episode that we brought an expert on talking about thyroid and adrenals, but I want us, you to tell us again, what is a full thyroid panel for you? What markers are those so that people know? Yeah, I mean, you definitely want to check like your T3, T4, your TPO to see if there's any antibodies there. Mm -hmm. um, your, uh, I'm, I know I'm missing one. Your T3, right? Yeah. Reverse mm -hmm. T3, probably. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's. I always uh, forget one or two also. I mean. You guys the, can listen to Lacey's episode on this. Right. For Lacey full, Dunn wrote a book. Mm -hmm. She like the whole shebang. So the, all that information is there. So full. Oh, I had another follow-up question about the inflammatory markers. Do you personally prefer an HS, which is high sensitivity CRP versus a CRP? Or does it not matter to you? Um, I can usually get both done. Okay. So, okay. you know, I say like most conventional doctors will just do the CRP. That's more why I asked. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More functional doctors would do that. The high sensitivity, the HS CRP. Mm -hmm. Um, cause that just looks for like, it, it's a little bit more, well, the name it's more sensitive. Right. So yeah. okay. it'll, it'll kind of track that, but CRP is very, um, very reactive. So it can tell okay. you, it has like, a, I think I was just listening to something on another podcast about CRP, but I think it, um, the half-life is like 20 hours or something like that. So okay. it's, oh. it's more like if you have inflammation, like, like acute inflammation, that's when it'll be more elevated. Okay. And then the HS is just looking for the kind of like trace amounts. Mm. Okay. So it's a pretty good marker then. Like, so if you get a CRP and it comes back normal, it's, it's a pretty good indicator that like your body's not overloaded with inflammation then. Is yeah. What you're but the, your okay. sedimentation rate will be, if that's a more mm -hmm. um, kind of longer view look at inflammation. So okay. that one, oh, that's if, helpful. as inflammation's dropping, mm -hmm. that one will drop a little bit slower. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, for, for people who are like, shit, I think this is me. I think that maybe this is me. What are some of the things that they might be able to actually go home and do today? Because we've talked about a food component. Mm -hmm. We've talked about inflammation. We've talked about the gut. So everybody's going to feel a little bit more or less comfortable addressing some of those different areas. So let's just start, for example, with the gut. What are some things that they could do on their own that might just maybe it'll help now obviously the testing is going to be the biggest key it'll be a blueprint it'll help you focus your energy focus your your efforts but if that's not on the table for people or they're just not ready to do that on mm -hmm. their own what can what can they do i mean honestly i think the biggest like low, low hanging fruit is just cutting out processed foods yes because mm -hmm. that will then cut out you know added sugars, salt, preservatives, chemicals, all that stuff. That will make a huge difference. Great. Um, right can off the you bat. Explain, can you explain to us, what do you mean by processed foods? Because I think, mm. I, I wish we had a better yeah. definition for it. Because I think it's just so, people hear it and they're like, It's such oh, a buzzword. Like, it is a buzzword. And like sometimes yeah. like hummus is processed, for example, if you right. think about it. That you know, is, so yes. like what, what are people, what are you talking about when you say cut out processed foods? So I like to think of processed foods as anything that has more than like five or six ingredients and they have mm. ingredients that you can't pronounce okay. or they're ingredients that are food. So mm. all of your different mm. like chemicals, food colorings, like those aren't really food. Those are chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, That's like the best definition we've got of that, Meg. Yeah, that I know. Really I'm, I'm delighted. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I like that. So switch your, if you're a label reader, switch it from the numbers to the words. What yeah. are you actually putting mm -hmm. in your body? Okay. Yeah. Now, can I just ask really quickly, what do you, what about, what do you tell people about vitamins too? Cause I mean, normally when I see it on a food label, it'll say, it'll have like the big fancy words that you and I know for vitamins, but and then in the parentheses, it'll just say like, vitamin D, B6. vitamin B12, right? So like, you know, it's a vitamin, but I, have you seen, cause I've gotten questions about that before too, about like, well, what about the vitamins? Do they, I don't know if you know this, but is it, do they always have that it's a vitamin in parentheses so that like, I wouldn't want someone to read, um, 
cola calciferol and be like, oh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, right, but it's vitamin because right. you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> a lot of times, a lot of times when I see like the vitamins on there, it just it tells me that it's the food was like devoid of it, and they're just adding it yeah. back in to make it right. better. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Okay. I was just curious because I know maybe some people who are listening are like, that might have been a question. So anyway, (laughs) thank you for clearing that up. The vitamins are okay, but anything else Mm -hmm. you don't know, (laughs) that's, that's a, that is an indicator of something that's processed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, the other two big ones that I think really make a difference for people are gluten and, and dairy, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So, and I always say get, te- get like tested for celiac disease before you pull gluten out because you just mm-hmm. always want to make sure that you, um, mm-hmm. you're negative or I guess if you're positive, then that's obvious, but, um, yeah. And yeah, why is that important that. before you pull it out? Well, for one, if you're ever going to get tested for it, you have to add it back in because you can't get the glu- the celiac test with following a gluten-free diet. Yeah. Um, second, yeah. if you have, um, if you have kids, there is like a highly genetic component to celiac disease. So you always do want to know um, for your kids if you, if you're positive. Oh, wow. Oh. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, that would do it. Yeah. That's a good one. I never thought about that with the kids. Yeah. Meg and I are in a different world <laughs> over here. <laughs> right now we're in the, we represent the tank club to incomes, no kids. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that before. I love really? that. I can't decide whether I prefer tink or dink. There's also double income. No kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible and so much better. <laughs> oh my God. That is so funny. I love it. That's really great. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so processed foods, gluten and dairy free. How long do you recommend they people experiment with a gluten and free, uh, sorry, gluten and dairy free diet? Like how long do they need to hunt? As Kylie pointed out in a previous episode, you have to hundred percent commit to it. Yeah. So, I say at a say? minimum for 30 days. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if, if you're still not feeling better, then you can maybe try pulling more things out because mm. Some people react to like grains and mm. nuts and seeds and coffee and, you know, a whole host of other things. But mm. um, yeah, I think 30 days, you usually, most people feel better within like 10 days, to be honest. Okay. And what, what are some things that they can be thinking about either removing or adding in, whether it's food or supplements, whatever it is that you think to help focus on gut health? I mean, everything that you just said is part of that. So Mm -hmm. what, when people are thinking, gosh, I don't know how to take care of my gut. I don't know how to eat for my gut. What, what kinds of things might they be considering? Yeah. I always, you know, encourage people to eat fiber. So like from your fruits and vegetables, because that Mm -hmm. just feeds your gut microbiome. And there's so much research that really shows that you can improve and change your gut microbiome composition just by your diet, which is, Mm -hmm. which is awesome. Right. Because it's a really easy fix by just adding in more fiber Um, so so I would say fiber. Um, I always love bone broth just to help with the intestinal permeability aspect. I have a question about bone broth. Are you, uh, because, um, what would you say if I'm confused by it? So I'm asking for myself, but I'm sure there's other people (laughs) who are, who are confused by this. What would you say to someone who's just totally confused by like the quality of bone broth that we're supposed to be drinking? You know, like, are we supposed to be making it ourselves or is there brands that we can buy that are better than others? Like, I'm confused. Help me. (laughs) Send help. Yeah, I always say, you know, with anything, I aim for like organic and grass fed just because it reduces your chemical and toxic load on your body. So I know the one brand that I use a lot is um, Roly Roti. Oh, I I haven't heard of that. Can you say it again? Roly roti. I think that's what it's Roly-roti. called. Roly roti. I'm going to try to Google or it. Or roti so roti. I, can just see it, I know. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. I know very... a lot of people like kettle and fire too. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what I would. I, that's the one I see all the time. I've never tried it before though. Roly-roti. Yeah. The, oh. the roly roti is, um, oh. it's only like bones and like carrot and water. 
Oh, it's, I mean, that. it's very minimal. Yeah. Ooh, we love that. <laughs> That's really good. That's really, yeah. really good. Okay. So I'll tell you what. Yeah. It's L R O L I R O T I, right? Mm-hmm. Holy Roti. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Found it. We love it. Okay. So those are two good brands. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Making your own, though, it is, you just like put it in the thing and then you leave it there. It's yeah. the most minimal thing. It takes a while, but it, you don't, you're not doing anything, right? Yeah, if you if you yeah. have a crock pot or an instant pot or something, right? That yes. Makes sense. Can, can you do it in a regular pot too, like a big saucepan mm-hmm. or it has to be a, that. oh, okay, cool. Just, That's good. Yeah, I, I just, it's I get so nervous easy. about leaving something on the stovetop for like that long. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> it. I do too. I've done it though. I've done it. I think I've grown up with my father's leaving sauce bubbling slowly all day long. It's an all day affair. I don't think about it. For those of you who are not Italian, you need to know that it's sauce day. (laughs) That's what happens. It's an entire affair. (laughs) Well, last time I was home, it was a Sunday and I said to my dad, I was like, oh, what are you making sauce for? And he looked at me and he goes, Sunday. I was like, yeah, but what are you making it for? And he looked at me and he was like, what do you mean? It's Sunday. I was like, I understand. Please continue. Can you save me some? I'd like to go home with some. But that's also already factored into the equation. He's already figured yes. out how much he needs to make to send all of you home with months worth of frozen vegetables. 100%. And he now, he now really prides himself on getting gluten-free pasta as well. And he'll oh. say, because my mom is also gluten-free now. She's very good about it. And he'll also mm. say, oh, look, I think I've said this before. When I needed it, it was like he couldn't remember for the life of him and it didn't matter. But now that my mother is, he'll go, <laughs> look what I found for mommy. It's gluten-free. It's, <laughs> it's always mommy, by the way. Look what I found for mommy. It's gluten-free. Can you eat this too? As if it's oh like this God. brand new idea that mm. I didn't teach them. <laughs> Papa Steve coming in clutch with the gluten-free pasta. Papa Steve, every single time he has a snack. Do you see? It's gluten-free. Do you see right here? It says it. You can have this. Here, have a bite. I'm sorry that your the the do acknowledgement wasn't. It's, it's not so given. funny. <laughs> it's so sweet. He is so in love with my mother. It doesn't even matter. I don't even care. Aww. I can't. I can't. How could you care? He's so Aww. sweet. Anyway, okay, okay. okay, not to get on and on about the gluten-free piece, <laughs> but I think maybe this is a nice, a nice little, um, a nice time to say, it isn't as if everybody needs to be gluten-free. I know everybody says that, oh, it's a thing mm-hmm. and now it's popular and I don't, now everybody has a problem. Well, sometimes, <laughs> you know, it really is true. Mm-hmm. Try it. You don't have mm-hmm. to commit to it for the rest of your life. You could just decide to try it. And then Mm -hmm. see how you feel. And that will be your proof. And if you are not still feeling well, then Annie, can you tell us how can people get deeper levels of help through you specifically? How can they find you? What do you have coming up? Because some of you are already here. Some Mm -hmm. of you are already at this point. I've tried the gluten-free. I've tried the dairy-free. I am eating four or five different foods and I still don't feel Mm -hmm. good. I don't, Mm -hmm. there's something else going on. First of all, you're right. There's something else going on. So Annie, tell us about what you've got coming up here and how it can be helpful for people. Yeah. So I have a free webinar coming up um, or free event. I don't know. I don't like the term webinar. It seems weird. Sounds so clinical, right? (laughs) I know. Um, It's called Discover Your Root root Cause, um, How to Heal Your Autoimmune Disease. So, you know, part of the just part of my own journey and in uncovering all of these things that may have triggered my autoimmune disease. It's just, it's important to know them in order to heal. And a lot of times it's not either, you know, well apparent or you may not know of them. And there's a lot of things that you can do to address all of them. So I'll be talking about that on Tuesday, I guess tomorrow, the 21st. Yeah. Tomorrow the 21st. <laughs> And where, so we'll put the link to that in the show notes, but, um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Keep, keep sure. going. Cause I just want to, I wanted to point out that that link will be in the show notes. But yes. That was, yes. That awesome. Was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you can go to my website. It's annierubin.com to find out more about me and my services. Um, I do, uh, all virtual counseling, so it doesn't matter where you live. You can mm. still work with me. Um, and I do individual and I do uh, group programs as well. I'm actually coming out with a like, mm-hmm. group program 
our next one launches in uh, July. So, oh, and is so that fun. about autoimmunity? Yes, it's all about autoimmunity. Yeah. Amazing. So I've basically taken like the work that I do one on one with my clients and I've morphed it into a group program. So for people who um, want more of like a community, which I think is, is Huge. important and awesome to have, um, that they basically get the same guidance and treatment it's just in a group. it's so huge it's so important you guys to not if you guys are feeling in any way alone in in whatever journey of healing you're in right now mm-hmm. know that that is um it's a barrier add that to your list of barriers you yes. cannot move forward when you feel alone it's debilitating so whether you're mm-hmm. working with just one person or you're going to get yourself in a group like she was speaking about it doesn't really matter but get yourself support Get yourself support. Mm -hmm. You can't do it alone. You can't be your own person, right? We all have our own practitioners that do different versions of the work that we do for us. We can't, we are not our own people. Mm -hmm. We've tried it. It doesn't work. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And I will say too, I mean, for, for so many years, I, you know, I hid my autoimmune disease. I didn't talk about it. People didn't know that I had it because I didn't want to be seen as someone who was weak and sick. And Mm -hmm. it was only until I really kind of started working with my own clients and started focusing on autoimmune disease that I'm like, you know, I need to share my experience and Mm -hmm. people need to know because like having that community is just so important. Annie, yeah. why did we not oh talk gosh. about this earlier? That is such a huge piece. There's a big stigma that comes along with it. You're like mm-hmm. one of those people. Yeah. Um, well, you're not. Let me clarify. You yeah. might feel that way. You're not. Mm-hmm. I think your point is that there are way more people than you probably know about, meaning listener probably know about, and even more than the medical community probably knows about because so many people Mm -hmm. go undiagnosed. So it's really starting to become a human condition, unfortunately, of having to navigate the stress and toxins that are inevitable in in the human experience right now. So, Mm. you know, chalk it up to being in this world this time around, my (laughs) friends. (laughs) I don't know what Um. else to say. I don't know. Can I just ask one more question? Because I'm dying to ask if that's okay. <laughs> just one more thing. I want to, um, for those of you who might be just very hesitant to cutting out gluten or dairy, that can feel very scary or for whatever the reason is, cook for a family, whatever it is. Annie, are there either any different forms of gluten products that they could try or any different types maybe that might be less reactive? And, and I understand please understand that this comes along with like, this is not an elimination diet. So if it doesn't make you feel any better, then that could be expected because you're still eating gluten. If that is inflammatory for you, it's still going to cause problems. But for some people, I'm wondering, maybe they're the handful of people who have these symptoms and it's not related to an autoimmune issue. But I'm just curious, are the, is there anything like that at all that you can think of? I mean, there's so many gluten-free products right now. It's like ridiculous. I mean, mm-hmm. when I w- went ridiculous. gluten-free, it was in 2005. So mm. if you can imagine, I'm like there totally was probably aging nothing. myself. <laughs> <laughs> there was literally absolutely nothing. And I would go to restaurants and I'm like, I can't have gluten. And they're like, what's that? Like, oh, it yeah. wasn't, a, it oh, wasn't a thing. No, it's so, not. There's, I mean, mm-hmm. compared to like my experience, like yeah. there are so many great alternatives now. Right. I mean, okay. and even baking wise, you can, mm-hmm. you can make a lot of stuff your own too. But okay. I think there's, a, you know, there's really great breads, um, mm-hmm. you know, muffin mixes and pasta even. I love like the, it's even like the, the bean pasta, like chickpea pasta, lentil pasta. I do. All that oh, stuff my favorite is so good. modern table. I love modern table. That's my Ooh, favorite. I've never free pasta. You got to try it. It's so, oh, so good. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I was, that's a great point to make is that it sounds like what you're saying is it's much easier nowadays to be gluten-free. So people don't necessarily have to be so scared about it. Yeah. Um, I think where that question came from was like, I have some clients who will buy wheat products from like Europe and they'll mm. spend because they can eat. So I guess that was kind of what I was thinking of. Is there 
any, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you do that in your practice or if that's even true, but I, just something that my client, some of my clients have mentioned to me that I'm curious about. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people do tolerate like flour from France better than mm -hmm. flour here because it's processed differently. Like the mm -hmm. way that flour is processed here is they, it's just, there's actually more gluten in it. So mm -hmm. if someone's like gluten sensitive, like mm -hmm. slightly sensitive, but not like yeah. fully like a gluten reactive, you know, right. they can probably tolerate it better. Okay. That's, that's a great, I think that's really good for people to know too. Cause I do think we didn't have enough time to really, well, this episode was about autoimmunity. And so from that lens, people who we're talking about who would be sensitive to gluten probably have a pretty major sensitivity to it yeah. <laughs> just yeah. because of that lens. But for those people who are having these crazy symptoms and maybe just have a slight sensitivity or something and are feeling very resistant to trying to cut things out, I just wanted to have something extra for them maybe that they could try. So I thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Annie, this is so great. This is so fun. Are normally, we're normally on opposite sides of a screen with like four or five other people being <laughs> taught something. So this huh. was so nice to just be able to to talk about the things that we do. We Annie and I see a lot of very similar clients on opposite ends of the country. <laughs> and um <laughs> it felt a little bit like we were able to geek out. I mean, all three of us, actually, we really cover, we really cover some space. The three of us, Meg got, Meg's got the ocean over there in Hawaii. <laughs> and then Annie's got, I do. where are you, Annie? I'm in uh, California, Bay area. Bay area. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, there's always a million different time zones when we're on these calls. So I just, yeah. <laughs> I just start tuning out to it, but Call, Annie, covering a lot of ground. thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for teaching. Yeah. Thank you for creating millions more questions in the minds of the people who are listening, mm -hmm. because that's how these conversations go. But as yes. always, you guys, please don't hesitate after you are done listening to utilize the contact information. So reach out to Annie. Get yourselves mm -hmm. registered for her free event tomorrow. Yeah, and don't forget, really if you're listening cool. to this on Monday, this event is tomorrow, the 21st of June, 2022. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening mm -hmm. to this next year, forget it. You're too late. But... <laughs> will Will there be a recording, Annie, at all? So for if some if people are listening to this episode later in the week, maybe, and they want to join, but it, it's past. Yeah, I'll have the recording up until <clears throat> um, I think Saturday. So they still, they still just need to register for it. And then I can send okay. them the, the recording. That's they, perfect. We can't that's, make it. Okay. So that's Saturday, June 25th, right? Mm -hmm. Great, you guys. Okay, cool. So, so And outside of that, just reach out. Reach out to Annie. Reach out to Meg. Reach out to myself. We, we are here to help. And if there's something that we don't know, which there probably is. Plenty. Will be. <laughs> there's plenty. <laughs> we will do our best to guide you in the direction of the person that that we think would be very helpful for you. So that is why we do this. That is the point of, of bringing this and people like Annie to you. So please remember that. Ask mm -hmm. for what you need. Ask for what you need. Um, somebody will know. Somebody will Great know. Great way to, to put you. that. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll put all your contact info in the show notes. Annie, where can people find you online? Like you mentioned your website. We talked mm -hmm. about your event. Do you have any social media that people can connect with you on? Yes, I'm on Instagram. I'm the dot autoimmune dot dietitian, awesome. um, and Facebook. I'm Annie Rubin Nutrition, cool. and um, that's that's it. Okay, that's all I can thanks. handle. Yay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, me, me too. I hear, I hear Meg's you. got TikTok, and I just can't. She's but great at it. I gave up Facebook for TikTok. I do not go on oh. Facebook anymore because mm. I can't. I yeah, can't handle is. more than two. So I prioritize. And much. TikTok's like so much fun. So I truly enjoy. Oh, it's hard to work for you. It's hard to work. It is, it's, it is the true expression of a Leo's joy to ah! just get to make my videos about myself and the work that I do all the time. Amazing. <laughs> I'm the star of my own show on TikTok. It's great. I'm 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 here for it, Meg. Absolutely yes. <laughs> Absolutely yes. Oh my god. Annie, what sign are you? Sagittarius. Oh, oh, that's so fun. Okay, cool. Mm. I love I have a lot of very fun Sagittarians in my life. I adore mm. them. I love yes. Sagittarians. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you so much for chatting with us today. We got through your zodiac sign. We got through all your work <laughs> that you do. 
you know, the vitals, the vitals. The, yeah, these are these are the need to know things. So thank you so much for spending time with us and um, all the info. As a reminder, for those of you listening, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, I'll have like little takeaways from the episode mm-hmm. also in the show notes and how you can connect with Annie will also be in the show notes. So reach out to her, stay tuned, and we'll be back next week. Bye, guys. Bye, Annie. Bye. Bye. Thank you.